Jeremy W. Forsyth uh, has a problem. He basically, due to COVID, the Glasgow Highland Games in Kentucky uh, have had to close after running for 32 years solid. Um, and this has a lot of people upset, including Jeremy. He's asking us, um, how could a person or a group of people go about reviving these games? How do you bring back a popular Highland Games event from the dead? Do we know how big the Glasgow Games in Kentucky were? I do not offhand. Okay. Matt, can, Matt can maybe hit the Google machine while we're talking. You can the, tell us. Um, but size definitely matters. No joke intended. Yes. The, uh, I see what you did there. Yeah, that um, wasn't really supposed to be a joke. The, what do you, how do you revive a game that have gone out? I don't know if you can, but here's some thoughts. Um, one, reviving it is, I, I'll, I'll sound jerkish saying this, but I'll say it anyway. It's a bit presumptuous to know that, or to think that you can run it better than they could run it. You may be able to get their mailing list and kind of like scale it back some or do a smaller version of it. But I don't know if a full revival will, you know, right out of the gates is going to work. The larger the games are, the more is involved in putting on the games. Um, we did a, a very small, which wasn't games, it was a, f a festival. It's festival. Uh, yeah. yeah, street fair slash festival in, in Phoenixville when we were over there. We ran that with a guy who actually ran Celtic festivals. We ran it together with him, Bill Reed. Um, and that, for me, was A, an extreme learning experience of what actually goes into putting on a full festival. Because um, it's not just like, hey, let's have a big party and people will show up. It's, you know, finding sponsors. It's getting permission from the town, mm -hmm. the township. Mm -hmm. It's about finding porta potties. Mm -hmm. It's about getting food vendors and, and uh, uh, kilt vendors and all kinds of, you know, Irish mm -hmm. and Scottish vendors. It's about finding the musicians. It's about setting up stages. It's about finding equipment too, so that they can make, you know, music on the stage. Right. So there's a lot more that goes into it than a lot of people realize just kind of that enjoy the festival on the day for what it is. I mean, we would literally spend months and months, you know, planning ahead of time. You know, you have to start six months before the festival to start planning up for all the contingencies Easily. and thinking about all the different stuff. Um, and then when it gets down to crunch time, something always goes wrong or it's going to rain or you have to figure out parking or, you know, something you didn't think about. Um, so it's a lot more difficult than a lot of people realize. Mm -hmm. So I would say this. I wouldn't necessarily try to revive the games that have already existed, um, especially if you are brand new to doing this. What I would probably say is start small. Start with your own Celtic Festival in the same area. Try to find out, you know, get in touch with the people who ran it. Try to find out, you know, the vendors that went there. Try to find some of the same information to give you a head start so you're not doing the whole thing from scratch. Um, but at the same time, start smaller and then build it up over time. Because the bigger you get, it's the, you know, mo money, mo problems kind of thing. The bigger you get, the more problems you run into, whether it's police and security for the event, whether, you know, it's, it's all these things that you're like, oh my God, I have to pay police overtime because we're over 5,000 people for the event on a single day. And what am I going to do with this? Where's that money going to come from? Um, that and the second thing I would, or the other thing I would say is find someone or hopefully you have someone who is invested in it emotionally, who wants to see it through as much as you do. This is a time suck. You need a major amount of commitment from volunteers or from a volunteer or somebody else to help you run it. Because um, if it's just you doing it, you're going to pull your friggin' hair out. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what would happen to him? Indeed. <laughs> so I would say try to find one or two other people, not too many, because you don't want to have a death by committee where you decide one thing and everyone right. decides something else. But you want to have a few people that are really, really emotionally invested to make sure it goes on or a team of volunteers that can help you on the day or make phone calls or, you know, send out flyers or whatever. But it's there's a lot of things that go into running a festival. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say um... – Definitely start small. I mean, even if your first event turns out to be a little more than a block party, 
Um, it could be what people really need. It could be the shot in the arm that people like you are looking for. So any effort is better than nothing happening. Um, but absolutely get in touch with as many people, any, any veterans you can from the old festival or other events you know of and, and get some inside skinny on how things work in your region. What are the best tips and tricks? Who are the vendors that they've used for various services in the past? Who's reliable, who isn't, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do as much homework as possible and make as many connections as possible and then build a highly efficient organization for yourself. Like Rocky was saying, you should not have too many people at the top, um, but you absolutely need to build a dedicated team and you need to delegate. You need to get to a point where you have you know one person who's the, the head honcho, the buck stops here, and then a team of people underneath him or her who can basically be delegated to to do certain tasks and then so forth. Um, my old organization, the Society for Creative Anachronism, had this down to a fine art, but we were basically doing it, um, everything was volunteer based. Everything was volunteer based. And uh, events run all the freaking time and they're not intended to earn a profit. I think that's another important factor is that you're not trying to turn a profit with this. You're trying to break even so you can do it next year. Um, and by virtue of having a massively dedicated volunteer organization, people were able to put together events um, from small things like 50 people all the way up to the Pensac War, which is like 12,000. That's a whole nother kit and caboodle. I mean, that's basically a mini city, you know, right there. That's a huge undertaking. Um, but start where you are. Start small, get the social network going first, and get the homework done first. And it could be good. It could be good. But Two quick hacks. Two. First, um, if you have other Celtic festivals within, you know, an hour-ish drive of you, go to other Celtic festivals and talk to vendors that are there right. and give them your card or whatever and say, hey, we're going to be putting on an event next year in July. You know, would you be interested in going? You know, here's our information. Mm -hmm. have, have a website or something that they can see some information. But start by, if you can't get in touch with somebody from the existing organization that just folded, try to reach out that way. Right. Same thing with musicians. If you see some really, really cool musicians, either A, go on their website, or B, you know, talk to them at festivals and, you know, in their off time, don't bother them too much. But, you know, give them your information, see if you can get their information so you know who to contact to book them for your events. Now, the other thing that a lot of people don't think about is the date. When yeah. you are running a festival, you, a really you have point. to be concerned both about other Celtic festivals in the area as well as other events in the area. Yep. So, for instance, when we ran the Phoenixville Celtic Festival, we did it on May 8th or 10th, whatever it was, the weekend after Mother's Day or right before Mother's Day. Um, and we did it specifically because there weren't any other Celtic festivals right in that weekend in the, in like an hour or two hour drive. Now we try to make it, we tried to make it so that there was something like if a lot of Celtic vendors will actually kind of travel or tour the country and just go from festival to festival, to festival, to festival, to festival, to festival and you know, in a big van and take all their stuff with them. So you want to be on the path that if there's one festival an hour North of you, the weekend before, and there's another festival an hour south of you the weekend after, you're kind of a little bit more likely to get some of the vendors in that area. Yeah. Also, make sure that you're not uh, uh, booking things on the same date as another festival or another thing local event. So when we did Phoenixville, there was something that had called the Dogwood Festival, which was the same weekend every year, and we made sure it wasn't in, you know, uh, uh, competing with that because that was the weekend afterwards. We wanted to make sure we weren't competing with that event, or there was a bike race that ended up competing with ours, and that became a problem over time. Mm. We had the date first, and then they booked the bike race around us. Mm. So it it draws <clears throat> people out of the event or if if it's a family of four they want to go out and do something on the weekend and there's a big beer festival that's 15 minutes from your event on the same day they're going to pull some of your audience to that event not this event so you if it's a lot as i said there's a lot of moving parts involved so you're trying to make sure you're having as many contingencies and thinking about as many angles as you can to really set your event up for success yeah I would say, um, and you made me think, um, as you're going and approaching those people, be completely transparent. Say, look, 
this is a new thing. We know it could be small. We do have these people lined up so far. Just so you know, these are the people who are committed to being there. This is what we don't have. You know, we want to help you enjoy it and get something out of it. But we're not going to BS you and say this is, you know, full-blown, you know, replacement for super grand Highland games. Yeah. You, know, you got to be transparent and upfront with everybody you're dealing with. I think mean, that goes without saying. Yep. Just as but, in business. but And if it's a local event, um, fundraising with local sponsors is the key. When we did yeah. Phoenixville, we, so we talked to um, the couple different banks in the area. They're always looking to promote local events. Mm -hmm. We talked to the local hospital. We talked to two Irish uh, Irish bars that are essentially on the same block. We talked to a bunch of different businesses and had different tiers of sponsorship opportunities. You want to make it a win-win for everybody, a win for the business, for local visibility. You want to make it a win for the entertainers. You want to make it a win for the vendors. You want everybody to win at the event. Right. And that is how you have a successful event. As many people getting feel like they are getting more out of it than they are putting into it, that's how you have an event that is successful and goes on year after year after year. I think you made some really good points there. Yeah. I yeah, agree. We got a whole how-to. Man, part, we need right a whole freaking list yeah. on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Got it. It's cool. almost like we've done this before. Yeah. That said, good luck. Yes. I hope you can do something. Yes. It's a. Do not underestimate the amount of work and effort and phone calls that you are going to put into it. It is a lot more work than yep. a lot of people realize. Yep. And it's. I won't say it's a thankless job because on the day you're kind of like the mini celebrity, like, oh, you know, this is awesome. We're having a great time. But it's you don't get any thanks until the day, and then as soon as it's over, you get nothing until the next year. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good luck. Reviving Highland Games or supporting your Highland Games or starting your own Highland Games is really the noblest of causes to support this culture and to keep it going forward and to keep it alive for generations to come. If there's a particular Highland Games that you go to every year or that you really just think is awesome, please go to the Kilts and Culture group on Facebook and let everybody there know about the Highland Games that you love. If you wanna support our channel, please give this video a thumbs up and follow us so that you get notifications next time we come out with a new video.